We're obsessed with creating content. We've created content destroyers. Smartphones and social media apps cultivate a deadly cultural narcissism. It's impossible to love and respect others when you focus all of your attention on loving and admiring yourself. Modern culture baits us to see ourselves as individual gods. We self-worship at the churches we construct on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Snapchat. The children who videotape themselves stoning and beating James Lambert in Philadelphia reflect the values of our time, the culture we've cultivated. They're as narcissistic as our leaders, our educators, and our celebrities. Welcome, welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Friday. Uh, we made it. We made it through another work week. The weekend is here. And man, do I have a fantastic show planned for us that will get us into the weekend with a smile, something to think about, something to reflect on. Shamika Michelle uh, is going to uh, join me. Al uh, Larry Alex Taunton. You, we've had him on before. He's an author, a public intellectual. He's written a great piece about uh, David and Bathsheba and how progressives and the left are trying to rewrite that story. And of course, uh, Professor D. Delano Squires, he's going to be here. He's written a terrific column about the crisis in confidence Americans are having with our leaders and institutions. Uh, but as we like to do here, uh, we're going to start with a fire. I'm going to build a fire, then I'm going to bring Shamika Michelle in to fan the flames of that fire. And uh, you know what? Before I do any of that, this is what I need you guys to do. Those of you particularly watching on YouTube and Snapchat or I mean, YouTube and listening on Apple, give me that five-star review on Apple. Hit the subscriptions, the notifications, subscribe to this channel, uh, and get the likes up. You know, I always, I'm going to be in the live chat, as I always am. Get the likes up. Get the likes up. Leave me a comment. All right. Uh, Without further ado, I'm going to quit begging. Uh, without further ado, uh, let's get this party rolling. Uh, we think we're living in the age of content creators. We're not. We're living in the age of content destroyers. We weaponize smartphones, arming them with social media platforms that turned IBM's original invention into a weapon of mass destruction. Women and children are being slaughtered first. Pardon this generalization, but women and children desire attention the way men crave sex. Studies suggest men think about sex 19 times a day, or about as many times as women check Instagram for likes. IG is the internet holy ground for attention and whores. Women seek attention and men hunt for whores. Bikinis and yoga pants are the lowest common denominator that tie men and women together on Instagram. Facebook and Twitter rely on debauchery and criminal activity. Women are the queen pins of the social media dopamine epidemic. They sell dopamine hits on every internet corner. Darnella Frazier is the dopamine goat. She recorded the George Floyd video and America's journalistic institutions made her a hero for doing so, awarding her a Pulitzer Prize for content that inspired mass destruction. I'm not villainizing Darnella Frazier. She captured the final nine minutes of George Floyd's 46 years on this earth. Her video told a tiny, tiny percentage of what led to Floyd's death. It provided a distorted image of Floyd and police officer Derek Chauvin. It provoked emotion, chaos, and division far more than it revealed truth. That's what content destroyers do. They unwittingly create distorted content that leads to destruction. Young girls experience gender dysphoria at an alarming rate in modern America. They're suffering depression at rates much higher than previous generations. We shouldn't be surprised. They stare at their smartphones all day, 
swiping past pictures of seemingly perfectly sculpted women having the time of their lives. And then they wonder why they don't look like that or live like that. It's all an illusion created by volunteer content destroyers. The peer pressure to experiment with sex at age six, seven, and eight years old is unprecedented. The pressure is driven by the sexualized content fueling the social media apps in our smartphones. Last week, a state senator from Rhode Island, Tiara Mack, released a TikTok video of herself wearing a bikini standing on her head and twerking. Mac's mission in life and politics is to teach young kids about sexuality and gender. She's unapologetically black and queer. She wants to recruit more people to her way of life. But let's credit Mac for having a life mission. Most content destroyers just want attention by any means necessary. This week, a woman was captured on video climbing through a McDonald's drive through window to fix her own food because the employees said they couldn't because they ran out of gloves. The woman obviously did not record herself, but her motive is clear. She wants attention. That is the goal in life, attention. We've developed a generation with no higher calling or purpose than the seeking of attention and fame. Individual Truman shows, everybody, women and men, want to be the next Kim Kardashian. We spend every moment wondering if what we're doing is worthy of a selfie, a tweet, an IG or Facebook post. Selfarazzi is more dangerous and damaging than paparazzi. Three women vandalized a late night french fry restaurant in New York last week as a crowd of mostly men recorded them. Media reports claim the drunken women were angered when an employee charged them $1.25 for a dipping sauce. I don't buy it. Drunk actions are sober thoughts. The women wanted attention. Videotape debauchery and criminal activity are easy ways to get it. The women channeled their inner T.R. Mack. But let's get to the worst example of all of this. On Wednesday, prosecutors in Philadelphia charged a 14-year-old girl with third-degree murder in the beating death of James Lambert, a 73-year-old man. Surveillance cameras captured a group of kids chasing and beating Lambert at 3 a.m. A 14-year-old boy was charged in the murder earlier this week. According to media reports, Lambert asked the kids why they were out so late at night. Police said one of the young girls involved in the attack handed her cell phone to a 10-year-old boy and asked the child to record the attack on Lambert. We're obsessed with creating content. We've created content destroyers. Smartphones and social media apps cultivate a deadly cultural narcissism. It's impossible to love and respect others when you focus all of your attention on loving and admiring yourself. Modern culture baits us to see ourselves as individual gods. We self-worship at the churches we construct on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Snapchat. The children who videotape themselves stoning and beating James Lambert to death reflect the values of our time, the culture we've cultivated. They're as narcissistic as our leaders, our educators, and our celebrities. They remind me of Sarah Lopez, the pro-abortion witness who testified before the House Oversight Committee on Wednesday. Lopez called abortion an act of self-love. Listen for yourself.
relatively smoothly. Um, but what these restrictions are intended to do is try and make people, try and stop people from having abortions. But abortion is health care. Um, my abortion was the best decision I ever made. It was an act of self-love. And I'm here today to make sure that everybody who currently needs an abortion, who has had an abortion or will need an abortion, is not alone, no matter what the state tries to force upon us. Thank you. So The content culture destroys women and children, which means it destroys mankind. That's my fire for today. I, I, I just, I get, I just watched a woman say abortion is an act of self-love. And she'll be celebrated for having said that. This, this, we have the most narcissistic culture of our lifetime. Anything that stands in our way of us reaching our goals, us pleasuring ourselves, us avoiding the responsibilities that we create, anything that stands in our way of that can be destroyed in this modern culture we have. I, 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 I want to bring Shamika Michelle into this conversation because, again, if anybody's been following the show this week, last week, all the, the entire show, I'm telling you, I'm having this internal conflict with myself. Uh, you know, I I'm, I'm feel like I'm hammering women, perhaps unfairly. I don't feel it's unfairly. I'm just talking about what I see and what, what, I think we're all experiencing, uh, but obviously Shamika's a woman, she's raising three daughters, uh, but, but I see this narcissistic culture that we have globally, but really acute here in America, a as a reflection of like, women are in control of the conversation. Women are in control of culture. And that's why our culture is so narcissistic and so selfish and so illogical. And I'm sorry if that makes me sound like Archie Bunker, but that's how I feel. I'm trying to work through it. And so, uh, Shamika, I, I want to bring you into the program. And I, I, I'm going to start with a, a slightly different twist on the question because you're raising three daughters, I'm wondering what are you doing to help them navigate a world that begs them basically to worship themselves, participate in this social media climate that we have that's all about self-worship. What instructions, what, what are you, how are you equipping your children to deal with a very narcissistic world and culture that they're growing up in? I think one of the things I'm doing, Jason, is teaching them what self-esteem means, which is admiration for oneself, but also having self-worth and understanding their value. I think a lot of this that is seen or called as self-love really reveals that people have low self-esteem and a lack of self-worth. When I, I was younger, I worked in a jewelry store. Now, there were certain pieces that you could come in and you could just say, hey, I want to see that. But then there were other pieces that were more expensive expensive that you couldn't just ask to see. You had to actually give your ID and we had to hold on to it while you were looking at these pieces. And a lot of times now we see that people don't have any type of value. They're just putting themselves out there. Anybody can just take them and do what they want to with them. This Tiara Mac, this video, the women that we see on social media shaking their ass to the camera all the time, uh, they don't have any type of value and self-worth. They're not requiring anything for you to be able to just have access to them, to them like that. So one of the things I'm teaching my daughter is don't make it easy for somebody to come and just run off with your goods. You need to know who are they. They need some identification because you have value. And so that's the things that I'm teaching my kids, my daughters, 
that you have value and you have self-worth. Don't just put yourself out there. We were talking uh, last week, me and my daughters, and I said, there's no picture that I've ever seen of my grandmother, which is their great grandmother, with her in a bathing suit with her ass to the camera. None. She's not squatting with her legs wide open, you know, for the lips below her waist to give us a smile. That I've never seen that. And while I've seen her in bathing suit pictures, she used to do cruises all the time with, you know, her sisters or friends. I have never seen anything inappropriate the way that we see online today. Women have really begun to degrade themselves. They don't know their worth. They don't know their value. And as you said, they're attention seeking. We used to want attention for things of substance. And now all you need is a BBL. You don't have to have any type of talent. You don't have to have brain. Women say a lot of times, oh, you look at me for only one reason, where you're only giving them one reason to look at you for. So uh, when it comes to my daughters, I'm just really teaching them that you have to know who you are and not look for other people to try and uh, esteem you. You have to have admiration for oneself. I am I love this identification analogy that you put forth because I think it, it, it coincides with where social media has taken things. There are so many people with fake identities on Twitter or Instagram or in social media that there are so many people that we think and feel like we're connected to and know them through social media when we really don't. And so like, again, I used to, I made the argument long ago because again I'm 55 and I, I can remember back when there was one phone line in the house and there was no call waiting and so your mama had to be off the phone for you to be on the phone and 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 so it made communication more valuable so like if someone was taking the time to talk to you on the phone in that era it actually was a genuine sign of interest. That person had to work to get in line at their house to get on the phone and call you and fight off their brothers and sisters who probably also wanted to use the phone and blah, blah, blah. Whereas now, social media has made communication. So you have no idea who you're DMing on Instagram or Twitter. And, and it, it, the access is so easy it's it's all we got inflation uh basically there's so much money and it's like we put all this money into the economy and so the dollar isn't worth anything we've put all this communication into culture and now communication isn't worth anything and 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 i like your that's good advice for parents in terms of and teachable moment for kids is like do you really know the person you're communicating with in a real way? Don't fall for this cheap inversion of communication. And so, and so the people you're just so easily texting a picture of yourself. That's crazy. You don't really know that person. And now you're giving them license because they will do it as a man. I can just tell you, virtually every picture you get of a woman gets shared with your six closest male friends. And I don't think women understand that. And so I, I, I love that analogy and the way you're discipling uh, your, your kids. L let me ask you that, let me personalize it to yourself, being a public figure, being a, a content creator. How do you, manage your own narcissism, because we all deal with it, our own desire to self-worship and, and to draw attention. H how do you manage that just for Shamika? I think for me, I don't really take a lot of people's opinions either way, whether they're good or whether they're negative. You know, I had a pastor before that would say, you know, you have to be careful because you can know you look like trash, but a man will say to you, oh my God, you're looking so great today. Well, you better know that if you didn't take the time to get yourself together and your hair is stuck all over your head and you look a mess, that you look a mess. So I never really take what people say to heart, whether 
it's good or bad. I think that's one of the things that we are lucky for growing up in a generation where we didn't have that. Even when I, I think of these kids in Philadelphia, you know, there were times that I got in a fight as a young person, but you would get in a fight or even if you were having fun, you would do these things. And the only thing that uh, was was left was the memory of it. You know, now they want to go above and beyond. A friend of mine used to always say that the camera phone was the worst thing that to be invented for black people. And of course that goes across the board. You know, you have now this memory that lasts forever. And I think a lot of kids, and when I looked at that video from Philadelphia, that was one of the first things that I noticed. She went to the young boy to look in the phone to make sure the footage he was getting was the right footage. And I think they don't understand the reality of it. They want it to play back like a movie, not really realizing that in, in a movie, there's no one really hurt or killed. In a movie, there's nobody going to jail from that footage. They don't have the reality. And so they want everything to play back as, as a movie. I think for myself, you just have to know what's real and what's not real. And I think these kids are really lacking the ability to know what's real and what's not real. I definitely believe the camera phone has really uh, just taken us in a different direction. People are crazy. They do want the clicks. They do want the likes. And um, we have to be very careful of that. Communication now, Jason, is terrible. I tell my kids all the time, we had to actually get to know people because you had to talk to them. Now you see them, everybody will be in the room. Everybody's on their phone. No one's talking to each other. No one is trying to get to know each other. Everybody is on their phone entertaining people elsewhere when they're right in the same room with each other. People will text from inside the house. Hey, uh, can you get me a bottle of water? Well, you're right upstairs. Why didn't you say that to me? <laughs> so I think the camera phone, the phones in general now has have They've given you so much access, but there's no real communication and no real connections happening now. I, I, I was sitting there thinking about the, and you brought it up, the, the, the girl giving the boy the, the, the phone and record this as we're doing so. And, and it's so the opposite of my nature. And, and again, I don't know if this is a virtue that I'm about to explain, it could be a byproduct of being overweight. I, I don't know, and I'm just really just thinking out loud and haven't thought it all the way through, but I have traveled all over the world, have met, socialized with uh, virtually every celebrity in the world. Uh, and, and I don't have pictures of any of this. And I know other people that have pictures, anytime they run into somebody on the street that might have been on TV for five seconds, they take a picture with them, but I have no interest in that. And, and so, you know, when I die, they're gonna struggle to find pictures of, that show all the different things I've done, all the different places I've been to. And, and I, I just, when I was growing up, my brother was into photography and taking a picture was a big deal. Mm -hmm. And it, you took pictures at holidays. Uh, maybe if there was some big sporting event that I was participating in, he would take pictures. And again, I, I, I still kind of feel that way where other people feel like every day has to be documented. Every dinner has to be documented. And I can't, it's, I, can't, I struggle to get into that mindset. And, and again, I don't know if it's a, a virtue or, or whatever, but I look at the rest of virtually everybody else. They couldn't imagine not whipping their cell phone out and taking a picture of virtually everything that goes on. And, and again, we, we think everybody's a content creator and I think all of this content is actually destroying us that not every moment is meant to be recorded in my view. 
Right. You can't enjoy the moment. I remember dating this guy and he always wanted pictures. He always wanted to post videos of me. And I'm thinking that's annoying to have a camera in your face at all times. Just enjoy the moment. I just recently went on vacation and I realized I didn't post not one vacation pic, you know, I enjoyed the moment, just being able to be with my girls and my grandmother and my mom. I enjoyed the moment. I didn't constantly whip out my phone to record every single thing. I think when you're looking from behind that lens, you don't remember it because you're depending on that phone to keep that memory for you. There are things that I remember from a child without a phone, without a video, because I actually had the capacity in my brain to remember that. And now I think we've lost that, just like phone numbers. There was a time when you had to know people's phone numbers by heart. Now, you, a lot of times people say, let me. What, let me see. look at my phone to see what my phone number is. They don't even know their own phone number because we don't use our brains the way that we used to. So for me, when it comes to the camera and, the, and just snapping pictures of everything, get that thing out my face. Enjoy the moment with me and remember this because you may never have this opportunity again. You need to know that. <laughs> Thank you, Shamika. I'm going to let you go. Take care of a little business. Uh, keep it moving. All right, uh, Ronald Reagan once said, all great change in America starts at the dinner table. Well, there's no company doing more to help you bring your family and friends to the table than Good Ranchers. Good Ranchers delivers 100% American meat to your door. They guarantee your meat is born, raised, and harvested here in the United States, so you know you're, who you're supporting. I have personally tried it, and it is awesome. The T-bones, burgers, ribeyes, and even the chicken, it's all some of the best meat I've had. I mean, they age every cut to perfection so that you can enjoy a true steakhouse experience every single time. Every box is of superior quality, flavor, and value. Good Ranchers supports American agriculture and business. They support us and what we do, so go check them out. Support those who support us who support you, your country, and taste buds will thank you. Make sure to use my promo code FEARLESS to get $30 off your order, plus get free express shipping. You can make gatherings at the table common again with Good Ranchers. Take advantage of this offer before it's gone. Go to goodranchers.com fearless to start bringing people to the table, creating change in America, and eating seriously delicious food from Good Ranchers. All right, Larry, Alex Taunton, and the story of David and Bathsheba. Next. Welcome back. Uh, we're gonna roll out to uh, Birmingham, Alabama and bring in Larry Alex Taunton. Uh, Larry has written a long piece on uh, King David and Bathsheba because he's reacting to uh, progressives and the left and the social media apps, they're trying to recast, reshape the whole story of David and Bathsheba. Uh, it's one of the most popular biblical stories of all time. There have been movies made about it. Uh, but now the left seems to want to turn it into a story of rape, that David raped uh, Bathsheba. It's not enough that he was a murderer and adulterer. He has to also now uh, be a rapist. And, and what I found fascinating when I saw Larry uh, tweet this out, I think two days ago, I immediately went and read the whole piece. But, but what caught me is I know, and the argument I've been making is like, the left is rewriting American history intentionally, and that's just the gateway drug to them rewriting biblical history. That's the real agenda. Once, the, you know, the New York Times, like 1619 Project, we've rewritten American history, and now they've moved on to the Bible. And then, again, I, I see all of this connected, all part of a, a, a satanic movement to undermine confidence in the Bible, uh, to undermine people's faith in, in the word and the gospel. And so I wanted to get Larry on the show. And so Larry, I, I wanna start here with just a basic explanation 
and understanding. Again, I don't like to make any assumptions about my audience because you'd be surprised at the things I don't know. So when, when, when I'm trying to get people to understand a biblical worldview, I like to start at the very basic. So if you could just take a few seconds and explain the story of David and Bathsheba and why it's important. Yeah, I'd be uh, delighted to, Jason. Um, the, the the story, as you've pointed out, of David and Bathsheba is a very, very famous story. Uh, Hollywood blockbusters have been made about this story, and often people who don't even go to church uh, tend to know something about the story. And the story goes something like this. Um, David is on the rooftop of his palace. Uh, when Scripture tells us that kings are typically out at war, but David at this point, he's you know, he's a man who's exceeded his grasp. Life is good. He has multiple wives, concubines. He, he's bored, he, which is when men tend to get in trouble. And he's walking around on the rooftop, and what does he see? He beholds a beautiful woman uh, who is bathing on her own rooftop. Now, there's been much debate as to whether or not she was doing this to try to get David's attention or not, but most biblical commentators don't don't uh, lay blame on her for this. But David then asks questions, you know, who is that? He asks his own, his own advisors, and uh, they tell him that this is Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, one of his own soldiers. He sends messengers uh, over to, um, to ask her to come to the palace, uh, to bring her to the palace, and she does. Uh, the story tells us that he then slept with her. She went home, and she sent message to him sometime thereafter saying, I'm pregnant. Uh, you know, what are we going to do is, uh, is, is, is clearly, you know, her thinking here. And David tries to get uh, Uriah, her husband, he brings him back from the front lines, and he tries to uh, manipulate the circumstance so that he will go in and sleep with his wife Bathsheba. But Uriah is such a faithful and loyal guy. He says, you know, how can I do that? You know, when all of the other men are at the front and they're fighting. I, I, I can't do that. So he instead sleeps on the doorstep. So David now Dow knows that he's in trouble. Everyone will know that Uriah is not the father of this child. So David then uh, plots to have Uriah killed. And uh, he is. He's killed in battle in such a way as to try to make it look like, you know, um, this wasn't really a setup and a murder. And of course it was. And as the story goes, uh, some months later, uh, David has yet to repent of this. He's guilty now of uh, initially of adultery, then conspiracy to commit murder, and then murder. Uh, Nathan the prophet comes to him and tells him a parable uh, about a man who has stolen um, a ewe, that is to say a lamb that belonged to a man who, who loved it very much. And uh, David, upon hearing the story, he's so outraged, you don't realize it's a parable. And he says, that man should be put to death. And Nathan says, you are that man. And so this is the story. This is a way, it, and I should add this, this part to it, Jason. Um, the story doesn't end there. Uh, the story tells us um, that while God uh, punished David and Bathsheba by taking the fruit of this sinful relationship, their child, that David ultimately, um, you know, the Lord ultimately redeems this relationship. She becomes his queen, trusted advisor, and she becomes the mother of Solomon. Uh, so it's, uh, it's an extraordinary story of sin, a catastrophic sin, failure, and a very powerful redemption because Bathsheba stands near the head of the line of Jesus. It's, and that's why I believe, and you rightly identified, the left's manipulation is very important here because, again, the left is trying to impose this cancel me too culture where there is no redemption zero and 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 basically they're trying to draw david into he's unworthy of redemption uh not just murder not just adultery he was a rapist he should be canceled and and again this is just a gateway drug in my view of a manipulation of a biblical worldview the biblical scripture and, and again, it's the reason why history is being rewritten and they're coming for the Bible next. Is that the way you see it? 
Listen, Jason, I you are always giving me reasons to like you more and more. And your opening, you nailed what what this is about because what they are doing. Listen, um, the the left is driven by something called uh, intersectionality, which I'm I'm sure that you've had many discussions about on this show and and privately. It's a Marxist idea, but. The idea is to pit everyone um, against everyone else, whether it's you know white and black, whether it's uh, male and female, uh, Americans, non-Americans, and so on. But intersectionality, uh, the, the, the philosophy that is driving the left is, as you just pointed out, it's all about reinterpreting everything and everyone in the most cynical light as possible. So you retell the story of American history through the lens of all of America's sins. Never mind the fact that America is is uh, uh, one of one of just a, a tiny handful of nations that's that's dealt very publicly with its own sins, fought a civil war, passed uh, um, legislation and and amendments to deal with its own sin. America is, is a story that's known national redemption in a way that, say, Russia and China and many other countries never have. But see, now they want to reinterpret you. They want to reinterpret me. They want to reinterpret everyone through your darkest moments. And you see why this undermines more than just the story of King David. There are those who would say, well, what difference does it make? You're still a man after God's own heart. Because if you are redefining the story of David and Bathsheba, not as a not as a story, the way they arrive at this, Jason, uh, this this view of rape isn't by saying that David overpowered her. It's by saying that it is a quote unquote power rape. That is to say that there is a power gap between David and Bathsheba and a consensual relationship between the two of them is not possible. Well, let's carry that out logically to the rest of Scripture. What is the greatest power gap in Scripture? Well, it's between God and man. Uh, I mean, God is the very definition of power. Jesus says in John 15, 5, without me, you can do nothing. And yet God still holds us accountable for our own sinful choices. But uh, according to this reading of Scripture, a consensual relationship between David and Bathsheba is not possible, and a consensual relationship between God and man is not possible. And so... The, the other parts of, of the, and I want you to hammer the Marxism point, because again, I think a lot of times, guys like yourself, you're so deep off, and, and I'm, this isn't a criticism, I'm just trying to ex explain <laughs> for my audience, but, but again, you're so far down and have researched this, but there are some people that just don't understand Marxism, and, and yeah. if they hear that word, and they don't fully grasp it. They don't know what it's talking about. They don't understand Karl Marx and the political theory that, that drive yep, and how hostile, hostile it is to religion. And so people think that oh, it's just a political theory. Well, no, it's actually one based in hostility towards religion. And so it, it's it, anyway, if you could just further elaborate connecting those dots, intersectionality, its relationship to Marxism, and what the end game is with all of that. Yeah, I, I want to be very clear. I agree with you. Most people, their eyes glaze over when you start talking about something like Marxism. They, they think they don't know anything about it. But the reality is it has trickled down to a level where they've absorbed the ideas that are actually Marxist without knowing that they are Marxist. Uh, you know, the way, uh, you know, the way one writer put it was, you know, the American people are singing a song of German origin and behind it all is, is Marx, the master lyricist. So people don't realize they're singing that song. What that looks like is this, you see, Karl Marx, I, I most of us know this from school, you know, he, he taught that, uh, that, the society is divided economically between haves and have-nots, and he encouraged revolution you know, all over the world, and famously, of course, it occurred in Russia. But that model didn't work in the United States, and that's because social mobility was possible. You know, guys like my dad who, you know, who grew up, you know, extremely poor, they could, they could work their way up by, by working hard. They could get ahead. 
So, so his message of revolution didn't work. So his ideological successors, and this is where we are now, are people who said, you know what? Let, let's divide society a different way, not just economically, but let's turn people against one another uh, uh, by creating what we'll call power structures or hegemonies. And so I oppress you because I'm white and you're black. You oppress a woman because you're a man and she's a woman. Uh, the two of us oppress non-heterosexuals because we are heterosexuals. And so it goes. So it just keeps breaking society down in this way. Well, the way they arrive at the rape narrative here and what is driving the Me Too movement is this idea. It's the idea that men in power, so to speak, cannot have consensual relationships with women not in power. So you, Jason, you're a very powerful man. There you are, you know, at Blaze TV with your own TV show and you're you're rich and you're powerful. No woman, unless she's on the same level as you, can have a consensual relationship with Jason Whitlock. Well, this is ridiculous, but this is what they do. And so your point of pitting each other against each other is, is, and this ties this whole conversation together and why I keep talking about they're rewriting American history, they're going to rewrite biblical history, and it's all about pitting Christians against yes. Christians. Because, again, you talk, the SBC, there, there are people within that group that are adopting this progressive outlook Amazing, on yeah. this David and, and Bathsheba story and, and their, you know, churches are going egalitarian and all, all of that. But, but one of the critical ones that they've used, uh, particularly here in America, is they're trying to convince people, Christians, that Christianity supported slavery. Yes. And I completely reject that. Christianity is the reason we overcame slavery and eradicated slavery. Mm. But again, if you, the 1619 Project and all of this, it all ties together. It's all an attack on Christianity. It's all a, an attack on a biblical worldview. They want to convince you that Christianity is actually a source of evil. Mm -hmm. That if, oh my God, women are mistreated because of the Bible. Black people were held as slaves because of the Bible. There, none of this is true. The reason why America, why there's more freedom and more opportunity and a safe, more safety, uh, more upward mobility for black people in America than any place on the globe, the reason why women enjoy more freedom and opportunity and safety in America than any place is because of our Christian values that founded this country, but these leftists are, and these Marxists, let's get right down to it, are arguing the exact opposite, and they're trying to use the Bible to tear Christians apart. If Christians start bickering with each other, it's easier for this country to completely collapse. Yeah, um, you're 100% right, Jason. Uh, listen, my last book, published last year, is called Around the World in More Than 80 Days, Discovering What Makes America Great. Jason, I've been to roughly 60 countries, and um, what you discover is that those countries with the most freedoms are countries that have been deeply, deeply touched by the gospel, and America, America most of all. But what is very interesting about the tactics that you're describing that the left is using here is that I argue that those tactics would only work in a Christian culture. That is to say, I won't even say really a Christian culture, but a Christian-ish kind of culture. Uh, Americans have kind of you know, vague I, uh, ideas, Christian-ish ideas, you know, about loving your neighbor and, you know, about equality and things like this. We're, we're now not really rooted in Scripture anymore, but most people have been touched by those kinds of ideas. And so the left comes along uh, using a tactic that works very well with people like that, and that is, I'm going to make you feel very guilty because you're wealthy and say someone else isn't. And the idea is to leverage your guilt um, against you for the sake of getting you to hand over power. Uh, 
Uh, that's what's happening in this country. So this idea of, of white guilt, this idea that America is this great oppressor of people around the world, uh, what you discover going around the world is that America, when it has been an oppressor, it is usually by the left, meaning that they are forcing their worldview, the Clinton administration, Obama administration, now the Biden administration, their, uh, their worldview of um, uh, you know, uh, forcing abortion and homosexuality and these kinds of things throughout the third world. I thought it was fascinating, for instance, here I am in Nigeria, and the Christians there love Trump. Why did they love him? Because he called out Islam for what it was. And, and here they were, a people who are among the most persecuted people on the planet in that country being slaughtered by Muslims. And they were sick and tired of hearing Obama and George Bush and others say that Islam is a religion of peace. So America is a country where because of the gospel, because of great awakenings, because of abolitionists who were Christians, um, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, these are all things that came about because of a, a, a Christian ideas. Larry, I, I, we use this show to try to explain to people, black and white, that these div divisive tactics, and, and again, they're all biblically related, but, but I think, and I try to explain to members of my family, a lot of my friends, this whole notion that white evangelicals are our enemy, that, that the left is trying to convince black people, and they're having success, that white Christians are the enemies of black people, and that the atheists actually are our best friends. The, 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 the alphabet mafia, the LGBTQ, and the uh, Marxist trained people, uh, that started Black Lives Matter, that are LGBT, that admitted they're uh, Marxist or whatever, that they're actually our friends and supporters. And I just, I just want people, this is crazy. It is that crazy. Christians, because we used, to, black people used to be the most religious people in America. And, and we've been convinced that even white evangelicals are our enemies and it's a way of detaching us from religion and Christianity and to reject God. Well, how can you be for God? How can you be for Christianity? That's what white evangelicals do. And, and they can't see, and again, that, that's why I, I try my best. I, do, I don't want a political identity. I just want to be identified as a Christian. And, and I don't even like it really when people call me conservative, even though maybe I am, but I, I really understand. don't. All, all I really try to express is a biblical worldview because these words have been so weaponized to see ourselves as enemies that if we just, I'm just trying to, Larry is an evangelical. I believe I can call you that accurately. Yeah. And that's why I love him. And that's why I have him on the show. And that's why he wrote the things that he did. That's our common ground. And, and, and the people trying to get us to lean into things that we don't have in common. Skin exactly. color. Listen. Uh, uh, <laughs> go ahead, Larry, I'll let you have the final word. So, sorry, Jason, it's so easy to convince people they're victims, that my own, my own failures, my own lack of success, that it's really someone else's fault. And this is what Marxists do. They, 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 they come along, they don't only cynically redefine their enemies uh, to be seen in the most, the, the darkest narrative possible, which is what they're doing here with, um, with the story of David and Bathsheba, and with, uh, as you've pointed out, with, um, with American history, uh, but they do it with their political opponents. And they do it by convincing people um, that they are they're victims of of those individuals. And uh, you're right to point out that they claim that it's you know evangelical Christians. Listen, I just mentioned that I was in in Nigeria, but it wasn't just Nigeria. I, I, you know, Egypt, Morocco, South Africa, China, Vietnam, people with whom I. I had almost nothing in common with uh, the kind of foods I like to eat, uh, my cultural background, the sports I like, 
But because many of these people knew Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they're my brothers and sisters, and the bond between us was so powerful. And it is because, as the Declaration of Independence says, we hold these tr truths to be self-evident, um, that all men are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Those are all Christian ideas, and they have served to unite us as Americans for 200 years so that no matter what your background was or my background was, we could say, but these are our shared ideals. The left is trying to destroy that. Larry, thank you so much for the time. Thanks for writing your piece. Uh, you know what, this weekend you're gonna make me watch uh, a movie about David and Bathsheba. Why not? All right, uh, get your fearless army swag at shopblazemedia.com. Uh, our number one fearless soldier, Delano Squires. Hey. Welcome back. Uh, time to bring in uh, Professor D. Delano Squires will roll out to uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, Delano has written a column about uh, why he has a why there's a crisis of confidence. Uh, and we'll get into Delano's column. But D, I want to start you out with the conversation we were having in the A Block earlier uh, in today's show and, and about what I'm arguing today is a culture of narcissism that has mm. overtaken America, that is driven by our addiction to smartphones and social media apps. Everybody is obsessed with creating content about themselves and, and they're obsessed with themselves to the point, and, and let's play the clip again uh, that we played earlier, this Sarah Lopez uh, speaking at the House Committee for Oversight, the House Oversight Committee or whatever, and her describing abortion as self-love. Let's play that clip. Relatively mm -hmm. smoothly, um, but what these restrictions are intended to do is try and make people, try and stop people from having abortions, but abortion is health care. Um, my abortion was the best decision I ever made. It was an act of self-love, and I'm here today to make sure that everybody who currently needs an abortion, who has had an abortion or will need an abortion, is not alone, no matter what the state tries to force upon us. Thank you Thank so much, Ms. Time. This whole abortion thing. It's, it's just all narcissistic and it's not surprising because our culture is so narcissistic. Absolutely, Jason. I mean, th those words are heartbreaking. The, the fact that a woman would say that intentionally ending the life of her, of her unborn child is an act of self-love just goes to show how, how deep this spiritual rot goes, right? Because the, the, the womb is a place for creation where, where life begins. But when she says that having that baby, and I'm not sure how, how far along her pregnancy she was, but killing that child and having it removed um, as if it's a, a death field, she, she characterizes that as, as self-love. I mean, that, that's sad when, when you hear that. Um, but, it's, but it's unsurprising because this is the left's you know, most protected sacrament of, of, of their faith, of their religion. Um, and it, it really is a, a, a death religion in, in every aspect of the sense. You know, we've talked about it here on the show, from the abortion stuff to the indoctrination of children to the social, medicinal, and chemical castration of, of adolescents, um, all the way down. It's, it's death and destruction. So um, the, the, the fact that she said that is not, no longer a surprise because the left went from safe, legal, and rare to shout your abortion some number some some time ago, um, and they're at the point where they've just continued to push the line further and further as it relates to um, their views on abortion. Dia, I, I'm next week when Pastor Bobby and Anthony are here, I'm going to get their interpretation and their understanding of self love because this morning I literally was in the Bible looking up mm. what does the Bible say about self love, and and have we gotten it completely out of balance
because self-love is important, is mm -hmm. important, but it needs to be tempered by, uh, again, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And again, a Anthony, I think two weeks ago pointed this out, like that kid in the womb is your neighbor. Love mm. that child as you would love yourself. But it, what, what's your understanding of the Bible and self-love and, and just how much should we be focused on? And again, because I think we've gone from self-love to self-worship. Yeah, I, I think your last part is absolutely correct in terms of the self-worship. But even the, the concept of self-love, the way it is used in our, in our culture, in a contemporary context, um, I don't think it's biblical because when people talk about self-love, um, they often are using a definition of, of love itself that is unbiblical. So when we talk about love in our society, and sometimes even Christians fall into this, this trap, um, it's all about affection and affirmation. So if you love someone, you will cheer them on regardless of what it is that they're doing. It could be uh, engaged, they could be engaging in self-destructive behaviors, but we'll say in a sense of, of love, right, uh, of affirmation that no, th no, that is healthy. Jason, you remember in the height of the pandemic, after we learned that, that obesity was tied to COVID death rates, you had that magazine putting two clearly obese women on the covers, one black, one white, um, I guess in the spirit of, of racial unity, and, and saying this is what a healthy body looks like, right? So even as we are telling people that COVID is tied to um, certain chronic diseases, we're also telling them that to, to overeat to that extent or to, to live an unhealthy lifestyle uh, is, is actually healthy. So, so I, I, don't, I don't think that the way we talk about self-love is a biblical concept, and particularly when the scriptures talk about the, the, the heart of man being deceptively wicked and all of the things that come from our hearts, um, wrath and envy and jealousy and strife and murder and gossip um, and sexual perversion of all different types. So w when we find ourselves as a society affirming those things that God hates, those sins, it's clear that we have a, a, the incorrect definition of love. And in order for us to even begin talking about self-love, we have to calibrate our definition of that, of the root concept of love itself, um, according to what the scriptures say. All right, perfect opportunity to segue into your column, which I think has a little synergy with what, I, what I'm writing and talking about uh, today in, in terms of you start your piece talking about an exchange between Josh Hawley and mm -hmm. a Cal, Cal Berkeley law professor, a female law professor. And again, I, I, I'm trying to be careful because I'm trying to evaluate myself in, in mm. terms of, but, I, I'm looking at like, I, I come away with this overwhelming feeling like, man, women are just out of pocket, out of control, their feelings and emotions. The, 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 the Kiera, what's her, Bridges, I think is her Bridges. name? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that, that, that spoke uh, in front of, you know, the, these senators and Congress people about, and sh she was talking about or he was trying to get her to define what a woman is or she kept right. calling women birthing persons or whatever. L let's play the, the, the clip and then I'm gonna let you expound on where you went from there about why we have this crisis of confidence and leadership. But l let's play the exchange between Josh Hawley and this Cal Berkeley law professor. Before, uh, I, I wanna visit with you, Ms. Maskey, but before I do, I just wanna clear one thing up. Professor Bridges, you said several times, you've used a phrase, I wanna make sure I understand what you mean by it. You've referred to people with a capacity for pregnancy. Would that be women? Many women, cis women have the capacity for pregnancy. Many cis women do not have the capacity for pregnancy. Um, there are also trans men who are capable of pregnancy as well as non-binary people who are capable of pregnancy. So this isn't really a women's rights issue. It's a, it's, we can it's recognize a that this impacts women while also recognizing that it impacts other groups. Those things are not mutually exclusive, Senator Hawley. Oh, so your view is, is that the core of this, this right then is about what? 
So um, I want to recognize that your line of questioning um, is transphobic, <laughs> um, and it opens up trans people to violence by not recognizing that. Wow, you're saying that I'm opening up people to violence by asking whether or not women are the folks who can have pregnancies? So I'm one, I want to note that one out of five transgender uh, persons have attempted suicide. So I think it's important Because of my line of questioning? So we can't talk about it? Because denying that trans people exist and pretending not to know that they exist I'm is denying that trans people exist by asking are you? you if you're talking are you? about women are you? having pregnancies. Do you believe that there, uh, men can get pregnant? No, I don't think so. <laughs> so you are denying that trans people like this thing. And that leads to violence. Is this how you run your classroom? Are students allowed to question you? Absolutely. Or are they also treated like this? Where no, you, no, no. They're, they're told that to they're at, opening up people to oh, violence. We have a good time in my class. You should join. Oh, I bet. You might learn a lot. Wow. I, I would learn a lot. I've learned you, a lot I just know. in this exchange. Absolutely. Extraordinary. The guy came at her, I felt, respectfully, and she hit him mm -hmm. with so much smugness and condescension mm -hmm. and just an illogic. Uh, anyway, go ahead and talk about where you took this conversation and applied it to what's going on in American culture. Jason, that, that minute and a half clip, plus the general corporate media reaction to it, our perfect distillation of everything that's wrong with our country right now. So you have a college, a college professor, a woman who has extensive education. I believe she has a law degree, a PhD in anthropology, who's in a congressional hearing um, using the term a person with capacity for pregnancy, right? Accusing a, a, US, a sitting US senator of uh, transphobia and exposing trans people to violence and then, as you said, responding smugly when he denies that men can get pregnant. And then wrapping all around that is, you know, the, the headlines from pick whatever, you know, platform, Jezebel, The Root, whoever, who say, oh, Professor Bridges owned Josh Hawley and he, she put him in his place. And as I'm looking around the internet, I'm, I'm saying, how, how, how have we fallen this far as a country? We put a man on the moon and we don't know what a woman is, right? So it's one of those things where all of the, the distrust and the loss of confidence in our public institutions is driven by the people who are leading them because those people are corrupt, incompetent, and completely under the sway of political ideology. Uh, Professor Bridges is, is a prime example of that, but she's not the only example of that. And, and you see it, um, I, I went on to talk about the public health institutions who beclown themselves during COVID right, who, aside from the fact that they said, if you get the jab, you won't get sick, and then they had to reverse course, they, in the height of COVID in June 2020, 2020, said that racial justice protests were okay because white supremacy is, is a pandemic that's been going, long, going on for a long time, but you still shouldn't leave your house to go to work, and you definitely shouldn't go out to protest if you're against lockdown orders, right? So everywhere we look, over the last couple of years, we've seen declining confidence in our public institutions, and you can lay that blame right at the feet of the people who run them. Delano, uh, one of the things she said here that is weaponized, I think, against well-meaning human beings, Christian human beings, is like, oh, you've opened them up to violence. And then she mm, defines yeah. violence as suicide. And, and, and I get the fear of, man, I don't want to say anything or do anything that depresses someone and makes them want to contemplate suicide. But I just don't think we can live our lives and operate in that capacity. And, and I'll give you a real world example. And again, I'm not doing this to crack a joke. Uh, I'm just keeping it real and keeping it transparent. It, it, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's almost like saying, telling a woman because, uh, again, back in the day, I, I would take a shot at any woman. And, mm -hmm. and uh, there were women that was like, hey, you're too fat or you're too, you know, not my type, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. should, should they be disallowed from, from saying that because, oh, it may hurt my feelings and I may commit suicide? Or can they stand on their truth and have their preferences and, and sit there and be honest and be actually correct? Like, hey, we're like, lose some weight. Then maybe we can date. Uh, yeah. You'd be healthier. That, it, it would be, but 
they've trapped and controlled people and controlled the conversation. Oh God, if you speak the truth, this person over here who is not grounded well and isn't stable may harm themselves. You've opened them up to violence. So therefore, so what truth can we espouse? Uh, if we see people doing things that are wrong or not healthy for them. I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head, Jason, and I mentioned this in the column that um, Professor Bridges ran the same play that all of them run, right? So she, she may have ex advanced education, but she operated like trans activists, you know, like this is the one-on-one -on -one class of trans activism, which is first try to manipulate the language. And, and you as a journalist know that when you take seven words to say something that you could say in one word, you better have a good reason for doing it, right? So she comes with this person with the capacity for pregnancy. Again, a bunch of gobbledygook. And then when Holly doesn't play ball with her use of the language, then she moves immediately to step two, which is to uh, manipulate his emotions and say, because you said something that's been true for the beginning of time up until 2015, because you said that only women can get pregnant, you are, your words are exposing trans people to violence, both violence from um, external parties and, and potentially violence that they would commit against themselves. And one of the things that I said in my piece, and I, and I want to, to hammer this right now, is that a lot of us have been sort of pushed back by that claim that the expression of uh, the, the, the biological truth of gender is itself an act of violence against trans people who may harm themselves. But if you take a step back and understand what's going on, you have people who believe that their mind and their body are at odds with one another. You should expect them to have a series of mental health issues. You should expect them to have higher rates of uh, anxiety, depression, and yes, potentially suicide. That, that's not a bug of transgenderism, it's a feature. So what, what I said is that um, civil wars, whether within the body politic or the human body, always have casualties. It's an unfortunate reality, but it's, but it's true. So it's, it's, not my, uh, it's not the lack of affirmation that is causing them to feel that, it's their disconnection from reality. So I, I think the proper response is to be compassionate to people who actually have gender dysphoria in the way that we would be compassionate to a young lady who, who actually suffers with body dysmorphia, such as anorexia. But I don't think we should give one inch at all to the activists who are trying to manipulate people into swallowing something that's not true. In the same way you gave your example, you, you wouldn't expect any of those women that, that you were shooting your shot to, to change the rules of what constitutes a healthy body or to them an attractive mate, simply because you didn't fit that at the time, right? So we don't look at a woman who's 5'7 and 85 pounds and say, no, actually you are pretty healthy. In fact, you're so healthy, we're gonna give you stomach, stomach stapling and uh, diet suppressants and to make you even healthier. We don't do that because we know that that would be hateful. And in the same way, I'm saying we should not allow our sympathy for people who actually suffer from gender dysphoria. Um, we shouldn't allow that sympathy to make us rewrite the rules of whether we get them from Genesis or human genetics. This all ties together with the entire discussion we've been having today, the discussion I have with Larry Taunton, and, 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 and the discussion we have virtually every day on this show, mm. is all of this is an attack on truth, and it's mm -hmm. like we're demonizing biblical truth. And, and it's very clever what the left has done. They've taken biblical truth, and we were talking about with, with Larry Taunton about uh, the story of David and Bathsheba, and, mm. and now all of a sudden the left wants to turn that into a rape story, and Bathsheba was raped, and, and, and it's all like they're rewriting history, and now they're rewriting the Bible, and, and they're compromising and corrupting truth as a way to disconnect all of us from God, and, and this the crisis of confidence that you're talking about in your piece is actually a crisis of confidence in biblical truth. And that's why I keep coming back to, this is all satanic. I, I, absolutely. I mean, the, the Satan is the father of lies. And so every time you hear someone open their mouth and tell you 
that, are, that you know, pregnant men and female penises are actually real things, you should understand that they're just uh, acting like their father, right? The tree doesn't fall too far from the nuts. So one of the things that I say is that um, all people, and particularly Christians at this point, need a firm grasp on the truth, the ability to think logically, and a heavy dose of courage. Because without those three things, we're, we're, we're stuck, right? We're, we are not going to move forward because you can't have a civilization where, where people are not sure who can get pregnant and who can't. And, and again, I, I, talk, I reference you, obviously, as a, as, a, as a journalist, but at a certain point, we won't even be able to read stories. Because when we read that a man committed a violent act against a woman, we won't be sure whether or not this man was born a man or whether this man, quote unquote, transitioned into a man. And the New York Times actually ran a story like that a couple months ago where it said, I think it was something like a, a 80, 80 year old um, woman killed someone. And this is like the second or third time that she, quote unquote, has been charged with murder. But when you read the story, you realize that they're talking about a transgender woman, quote unquote, so a biological male. Now, if you just read the headline, you'd leave, you leave, you know, the room scratching your head and asking myself, asking yourself, well, how does an 86 year old woman kill anybody? She barely has strength to pick up a cup of coffee. But this is one of the, the, the consequences of distorting truth and living in a world with an inverted reality. And, and at the end of the day, Jason, the people who lead our, our institutions, again, media, um, Fortune 500 companies, you know, uh, political leaders, all of these people, academia, these people are all ringmasters in the new clown world. And what I'm arguing is that we need, we, the people, the normals, need to stop paying the price of admission um, because we already see where this thing is going and we need to get off of this sinking ship. I think I, I have my own answer for this, but I, I want to hear from you. I'm because again, I'm looking for guidance or wisdom or just help because I, I see the Kiara Bridges and then I couple that with Katanji Brown Jackson, the Supreme Court, new Supreme mm. Court justice who couldn't define a woman. And, and, and I have like two questions like it feels like black women have been elected the president of the gender dysphoria issue. Mm. And it feels like women in general have been elected, uh, but particularly white women, the, the, the queens of arguing pro-abortion initiatives. And, and I'm just having an internal struggle that I've actually have been like seeking answers from God about like, am, am I becoming incredibly sexist? A am I wrong for thinking like, wow, women seem completely out of control and completely in control of the American conversation in a way that's unhealthy. I, I mean, I think what we're seeing now is um, the end product of 60 plus years of feminist indoctrination. And uh, I really see feminism as sort of a an expression of, I want to believe this, I want to say this is Proverbs 14.1, right? Where it says, I'm paraphrasing, but a wise woman builds her house and with her own hands, a foolish woman tears hers down. So what feminism does, it weaponizes, it, it convinces women to crush femininity in the name of fighting sexism. And really what it is, it is, sometimes people talk about cutting off your nose to spite your face, but what fem feminism does, it tells women to cut off their head to spite a man's face. And this is why they, they can't keep their ideology straight. So I, I do think, and particularly the intersectional version of this, right, when you add you know, black women into the mix, um, this is one of the things that the left is using as the tip of the spear for all of their most extreme ideologies. Black women are the face now of the LGBT movement, thanks, particularly thanks to BLM. They are, they are always mentioned as it relates to who's going to be most impacted by abortion, right? Thanks again to the, to the intersectional abortion activists. And it's one of these things where um, the, these women are arguing for things that are undermining their own progress in society. So 
w whenever you read the scripture, one of the things that you'll, you'll see as a consistent theme is that the enemy always looks to trick women and kill men. So whether that's with Moses or with Jesus, it's always kill the male child and deceive the woman. Obviously, that started in, in the garden with, with the serpent, but you, you see this coming out more and more even in our current political discourse. It's always the tools of deception and for, that go, are targeted towards the women and then the tools of destruction that are targeted towards the men. And the problem is, Jason, that our, many of our men have been so feminized that they are falling victim to the same deception. So they don't have the, stre the strength, the testicular fortitude to stand up and say, no, I'm not going to let my son wear a dress. I'm sorry, you may be his mother and, and my wife, but that's not happening in this household. Most guys can't say that because they've spent the entire gen the last generation being uh, uh, terrified by women. Most men are much more afraid of the woman they laid next to at night than the guy who's walking towards them on the street corner. With that guy on the street coming towards them, they may raise the fist, they may defend themselves, but when their wife or their girlfriend or whoever says, you should do this, Right. I want I want to let our daughter wear uh, juicy across her backside on the, on the little uh, booty shorts. Most guys are not going to raise a voice in, in opposition because they don't want to be seen as bad people. Right. So it's one of these things where people need to stand up, men and women, and begin speaking the truth, because if not, we won't even have a country uh, to fight over in the next generation. Delano, thank you so much. Uh, have thank a great you, weekend. Uh, enjoyed the conversation today. I think I hear tomorrow. That means we'll see you next week. My system, no relation, we all just wanna have freedom Sitting on the corner, never been alone I'll break my back for freedom Bless, we are living, get back We are receiving all the seed when we all wanna be free We want freedom I just want, I wanna be, I just